Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Culp. I'm the professor of media history and theory at the California Institute of the Arts and also the program director for the MA program in aesthetics and politics. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Um, we are beginning with a lecture by Hirt, also a presentation by uh, Ben, and then we'll make a whole evening of it. But before then, we have a few thank yous that we need. The first is to thank Red Cat and its crew for making it possible. It's such an amazing space. Let's all thank them. There's so much invisible labor that goes into making things like this happen, and really Red Cat's at the core of it. But I'd be uh, remiss to not also mention Maisa, um, a student in our program, who's in many ways the sort of heart and soul of the program that we've had today. Um, she worked with Hirt in Amsterdam at the Institute of Network Cultures, really helped conceptualize and make, really realize the whole program. So uh, thank you, Maisa, really, honestly, truly. Uh, thanks for the aesthetics and politics students who've been with us all week as here has been theorist in residence at CalArts, doing an intensive three-day seminar and one-on-one -on -one meetings. And in many ways, this is the culmination of those last few days here. And I'm so excited to be introducing here himself. Um, we connected when I was in the process of writing my first book. And it was, if I remember correctly, a very short, maybe like 30-minute a uh, Zoom call or something, and I forget if he suggested or I did to just like, just to talk, but it was just the motivation, motivation that I needed to be a little weirder, write a little bit more forcefully, and communicate ideas that the world really needed, and it changed everything for me. And um, my first book like has all of this amazing intensity and spirit that came from it. And there's no surprise because he's been a force to be reckoned with within media studies, he basically created internet studies as we know it from a critical theory point of view. I mean, maybe he'd argue other people came before him, but he's the name. And he's been the author of nearly a dozen books. Um, he pumps out one every three years. That's a major monumental work, but also in between all these great interventions as well. You have probably not seen it yet, but it's been floating around. Extinction Internet is the most recent one. It also has a performance component and we weren't able to unveil it here in Los Angeles. And so look out for it, because it's gonna be just as amazing as what you get here tonight. Um, so what are you to expect? This comes as a lecture performance from Sad by Design, a really remarkable book that came out in 2019. It's a lecture that he's also done in collaboration with people who did music making. As you see, it's a collaboration with memes. One could say even a uh, collaboration with the network or even the internet itself. And you know, I could keep going on and on and singing the praises of here. But let's not do that. Let's just bring him on stage. And after that, there's still more to come. Thank you.
dive into social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism hard coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Caroline Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other, the growing imbalance in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. During the 2020-21 lockdown misere, we've literally been stuck on the platform. What happens when your home office starts to feel like a call center and you're too tired to close down Facebook? How to get rid of your phone? Wrong answers only. We wanted to move on and use the pandemic as a reset, but failed. The comfort of the same old proved too strong. Instead of a ra radical techno imagination that is focused on the rollout of alternatives, we got distracted by fake news, cancel culture, and cyber warfare. Condemned to do doom scrolling, we suffer from an oversaturation of cringe memes, conspiracy theories, and a never ending barrage of COVID factoids and stats, including conflicting interpretations and senseless comments. Random is fun. In my chronicles, we're staying with the trouble called internet and continue to dig deeper into the current stagnation phase while also asking how to unstuck and deplatform the platforms. As you and I are not able to resolve platform dependency, we remain glued to the same old channels, furious at others about our own inability to change. Stuck on the platform starts with the confession, much like step one from Alcohol Al Alcoholic Anonymous, 12 steps. And we all know, I cite, we admitted we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable. Today's sadness is a system, an assemblage of mind, body and technique. Capitalist accumulation is driven by organized optimism. Youth feel the anxiety, the stress and become sad about empty promises and diminishing opportunities. They are the experts at reading daily life through the sadness lens. This does not mean we should medicalize them. Every situation, every object and service can and will be sad. This is why we feel trapped and do not see how collective action can lead to change. 
emotional rides are no longer experienced in solitude. The virtual others are always there as well. Intuitively, many feel that their mental mass is produced by society. It is not a sickness in our head. Capitalism is said to be able to deal with all these contradictions it produces. It is not. Predictable continuity is not just elitist, it's escapist. It walks away from the dirty present. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now, toiling around in the micro-mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair like everyone else. Franco Berardi, the Italian theorist, observes the mental state of today's students. I quote, I see them from my window, lonely, watching the screens on their, on their uh, smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to the expensive rooms that their families are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is not an option, in particular for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck in the abyss. The design is elegantly forcing to engage, make choices, click, agree, respond. If only we were capable of taking actions and making decisions. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only Robert Fowler's interpassivity was ever really implemented in code, instead of being yet another Austrian idea, we would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there's nothing passive about today's human-machine interactions. We, the streaming egos, scroll and swipe, obsessed with self-creation. Facebook, the sociological constant of our times, equals the unbearable lightness of nothing. Surrounded by this massive bubble of light matter, we literally see no alternative options. No multiverses for you. Jailed in the digital monad, you are free to dream about as many worlds as you like. Being on social, as the Italians call it, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted and we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive voyeur status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms and rank our taxi drivers.
enraged. You feel engaged, but still retreat in your safe rabbit hole. When you're feeling tired and nothing seems helpful, you've reached the end of the downward spiral. You ignore the signs and will pay dearly. But for now, nothing matters much. What happens when your social graph falls flat and you have nothing to talk about? You forget to like and follow and no longer respond to texts. The network around you collapses, but you feel incapable to act. Is this the joy of missing out? The epic shit of others no longer impresses. The perfectionism has killed you and you are face to face with an empty bucket list. Ducking tired, bored with Reddit, Facebook, Insta and others and nowhere else to go, it's damn sure you've lost interest in everything you were once passionate about. In his 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now, Jaron Lanier asks, I quote, why do so many favorite tweets end with the word sad? Jaron Lanier associates the word with a lack of real connection. I quote, why must people accept manipulation by a third party as the price of a connection. According to Lanier, sadness appears in response to unreasonable standards for beauty or social status or vulnerability to trolls. Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily, leading to the new uh, system-wide goal. Find personalized ways to, feel, to make you feel bad. There's no single way to make everyone unhappy. Compared to others, your ranking is low. And this makes you sad. You recognize total strangers on the street because you saw them on your friend's page. Your Facebook friends know you're pregnant before your family does. You choreograph your picture taking according to what would make a great profile picture. You know exactly what your ex from 10 years ago had for breakfast this morning. You don't see the point in reunions. You already know everything about your former classmates, including the poly habits of their children. You ask your spouse to change your Facebook password temporarily so that you can get some work done. You break up with your girlfriend by changing your relationship status to single. Ouch. If you want to know the results of a heat game, Marlins game or presidential election, you check everyone's status updates. You didn't get that great job because your would-be employer saw photos of you doing yellow shots while topless. Your lawyer uses your ex-status updates in court to milk him for all he's worth. Your just-out-of-jail childhood friend checks your TV because he knows exactly when you check in at Coldstone Creamery every day. The cops track down your kidnapper because you checked in at the mall and had not been seen since. You've threatened at least once to end a 20 years friendship 
over the posting of a picture. Your sister's friend, ex-boyfriend, says he liked your wedding dress. He wasn't at the wedding. Even technological sadness is a style, a bite, a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the, the brief in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of the current situation and onto another playing field filled with many reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion and a loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time meticulously measured on every app tells us right in our face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show that I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog culture tried to update the diary form for the online realm. But that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary stage of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day, like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness, a flash that opens the possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a vehicle, a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Each and every situation can potentially be called sad. Through this mild form of suffering, we enter the blues of being in the world. When something is sad, things around it become gray. You trust the machine because you feel you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero. But then the propped up ego implodes. 
and the failure of the self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. Great minds discuss ideas. Mediocre minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Premium mediocre minds discuss Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Venkatesh Rao. Go down into the underground and pass from the hyper virtual fleshless world to the suffering flesh of the poor. Pope Francis. I can't believe video games are real. Sarah Hodge. We are not afraid of ruins. We plowed the prairies and built the cities. Can build again, only better next time. We carry a new world here in our hearts. Malatesta. Anyway, it's always the others who die. Myself is shot. The internet is a metaphysical horror game, not a representational machine. At Buckner Cave. When defenders of this barbaric system talk about defending choice, We long to revolt against the restless zombie inside us, but we don't know how. Our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to behavioral modifications. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world. After yet another app session in which we failed to make a date, purchased a ticket and did a quick round of videos, the post-dopamine phase hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired and we have to stop. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression, anxiety, burnout and others. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition. Though, never say never, because everything can be turned into one. No matter how brief and mild, the sadness is the default state of the online billions. It's the original intent, if its original intention gets dissipated, it seeps out 
becoming a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Occasionally, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. A seething rage emerges. After checking for the tenth time what somebody said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable and we put the phone away. Am I suffering from the phantom vibration syndrome? Wouldn't it be nice if we were offline? Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we need to quit again? To go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, arouse us. And yet, we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. sadness in its technical form with the ancient state of melancholy. The melancholic personality seems to suffer from a disease. Unable to act, she withdraws from the world, contemplating death and other transient phenomena. While some read this condition as depression and boredom, others reframe this lazy passivity as a creative strategy, waiting for inspiration to strike. Instead of a fascinating derive into the vast arsenal of literary sources, I would propose here a digital hermeneutics 
that shortcuts philology with the eternal presence of the digital that surrounds us. Melancholy, often described as sadness without a cause, has a strong existential connotation. While, playing, while paying tribute to Kierkegaard, who liberated melancholia once and for all of its medical stigma, describing it as the deepest foundation of the human in a godless society, the problem here is not a vertical one of going deeper, but a horizontal one. The, the democratization of sadness happens through its thin spread across our plateau. Homeopathic doses flatly distributed via technical means. Melancholy is a thing of the past because there's simply no time anymore to indulge in a wistful state. One could, of course, defend that techno sadness still bears the possibility of melancholy. The implosion of the fact of time has all but sabotaged the possibility to seriously drift off. Real-time machines constantly draw us back online, capture our attention, and do not allow extensive mourning. Strangely, melancholy requires concentration and focus. Distraction, on the other, is all over the place, and sadness is microdosed. We online billions are not sick and not a valley patient. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Pump yourself. Dump yourself. We are not sick. We are not sick. We are not sick. of today's symptoms would be time or attention, as it is called in the industry. While for the archaic melancholic, the time never passes, techno sadness is caught in the perpetual now. Forward focused, we bet on acceleration 
and never mourn a lost object. The primary identification is there in our hand. Everything is evident on the screen, right in your face. While confronted with the rich historical sources that dealt with melancholia, the contrast with our present condition becomes immediately apparent. Whereas melancholy in the past was defined by the separation of others, reduced contacts and reflection on oneself, today's street stairs plays out amidst busy social media interactions. In Sherry Turkle's phrase, we are alone together as part of the crowd, a form of loneliness that is particularly cruel, frantic and tiring. What we see today are systems that constantly disrupt the timeless aspect of melancholy. There's no time for contemplation or Weltschmerz. Social reality does not allow us to retreat. Even in our deepest state of solitude, we're surrounded by online others that babble on and on, demanding our attention. But distraction does not just take us away from the world. This is the old, if prevalent, way of framing the fatal attraction of smartphones. No, distraction does not pull us away, but instead draws us back into the social. Social reality is the magic realm where we belong. That's where the tribes gather, and that's the place to be, on top of the world. Social relations in real life have lost their supremacy. The idea of going back to the village mentality of the place formerly known as real life is daunting indeed. How can we redesign the social in such a way that we will become that it will become impossible or even unthinkable for trolls, bots, etc., that try to permanently dis disrupt our thinking and behavior to occur? We cannot spend all the time and energy to reinvent the social without taking freedom into account. Not the liberty, of course, as defined by right-wing libertarians, but maybe freedom as Hannah Arendt and Isaac Berlin speak about. This is not just freedom from addictive and manipulative software. Can we rethink bots, algorithms and all the rest in such a way that they become pets? or toys or tools that work for us instead of invisible, oppressive systems that try to deceive and educate us. Technological freedom means the ability to put them aside, to turn them off. We long for tools that assist us instead of colonizing our inner life behind our backs. Our sadness will not be overcome with anger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hirt. What a 
wonderful uh, talk. Um, it's going to take a few moments for um, Ben to get set up. And so in that time, first I'll sort of promote a little bit of the work that Hirt has been doing recently. He has a new book that came out just about six months ago called Stuck on the Platform. Definitely check it out. I think it's available primarily in Europe, so you might have to wait a few, you know, a week or two for the ships to have them cross the sea, but you can absolutely get it. It's this really great neon green color. And then the Institute of Network Cultures, which he helped found, um, has been putting out really remarkable publications and other work. Most recently, the Critical Meme Reader 2, um, and there are even a few copies of that floating around. Make sure you get yourself a copy. It's also available online in PDF form. And there's just a remarkable amount of other resources and materials that you can find, including um, an album of the songs that you just heard uh, in their full length. So if you loved them and you want to get more of Hirt's, you know, meditative thoughts into your life on your drive, maybe uh, on your commute, you can get it and just get it on repeat and you'll be dreaming in internet criticism <laughs> um, <laughs> in no time. Um, so let me invite Ben Grosser onto the stage with a not just not, not terribly brief, but extended biography so we can... You can trim it. I'm not going to trim anything, Ben. We're going to get you all the way there because you have an impressive bio, so you get it. So Ben, you know, he creates interact experiences, machines, and systems that examine cultural, social, and political effects of software. But more than that, he's exhibited in venues that include iBeam, the Somerset House and Barbican Center, the Centre Pompidou, uh, South by Southwest, Museum of Modern Art Moscow, um, Museum of Communications Lisbon, Museum Kesselhaus Berlin, Science Gallery, Japan Media Arts Festival, Impact Festival, and the Digital Arts Festival Athens. His work's been featured in a uh, great variety of publications including New Yorker, Wired, Atlantic, Washington Post, LA Times, PBS, Fast Company, Hyperallergic, uh, Allergic, BBC, Telegraph, Le Monde, um, Carrier de la Serra, um, Der Spiegel, El País, Folha, and The Guardian, writing about his film, said that there will be few more telling artworks from the first decade of the century that are as mesmerizing with monologue and stories of our times. He's been called an antipreneur, engaging in creative civil disobedience in the digital age. He's been cited in a wide variety of academic and other literature. And he just so happens to also serve as an associate professor of new media at the University of Illinois, assembly fellow with the Institute of Rebooting Social Media at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Please join me in inviting Ben. Thanks, Andrew. So following on similar themes from, from Geert, one of the reasons that uh, so many of society's ills are rampant across and amplified by big social platforms is because they aren't designed to make us happier or to make society better, but are instead engineered to produce one thing above all else, engagement. And this is because the more we engage, the more they grow. And the more they grow, the more profit they make. More, more, more. And to induce our engagement, they use tactics like visible metrics, algorithmic feeds, infinite scrolls, and so many others, all designed to increase our platform engagement at any cost. What I want to focus on over the next few minutes is a small selection of projects from the last decade that illustrate a variety of techniques for platform resistance, where I implement tactics such as software recomposition, data obfuscation, interface reduction, resource based reflection, and radical reimagination. Looking at how software art can help us better understand what the designs of big social does to us, how we might regain some agency back and to see what alternative platforms can look and feel like when we reimagine their foundations altogether. And so I want to start with a screenshot of my Facebook news feed from nearly a decade ago. 
And here I've circled all of the metrics in red. These are the numbers that count likes, shares, comments, how many seconds ago something happened, how many birthdays you're supposed to respond to today. And as a user of Facebook back in 2011, I found myself becoming increasingly aware of just how much attention I was paying to these numbers. The prime example being that when I'm shown how many likes my last status got, I wondered how that was influencing me about what I might write for my next post. I've done some theoretical thinking and writing about these questions, theorizing about what I call the desire for more, or how our evolutionarily developed need for esteem is intentionally and endlessly activated by the designs of capitalistic big social platforms, leading us to always want higher social numbers. But before I did any of that writing, I started by making something. And in this case, it was a work that I called Facebook Demetricator. It's a free and open source browser extension that hides all quantifications on the Facebook interface, allowing anyone to experience for themselves what the effects of these numbers might be. And so on the left, you can see a typical like, share, comment box on Facebook. On the right is what it looks like with Demetricator installed. You can see that people liked it, that it was shared, that there are comments, but no longer is the focus on how much people like our status or how many comments we got, but instead on who liked it and what they said about it. And so with this work, I'm recomposing the Facebook interface, in this case, hiding the metrics, in order to investigate how metrics construct us as users. And I can say that feedback from users over the last 10 plus years uh, re has revealed that visible metrics make users competitive, compulsive, anxious, influences what people post, what they like, who they follow, often without them realizing it. In the years since, I've added versions for Twitter and Instagram and other platforms. I've had multiple legal conflicts with Facebook and Instagram uh, coming after me for this work, both well before and after Instagram, in particular, had an idea to maybe reconsider the idea of visible metrics. Uh, something they never actually wanted and only talked about and minorly executed in an attempt to first diffuse the post Cambridge Analytica critiques and then finally in response to the post Haugen outcries about their own research. Another big interface change that happened in this period shortly before the Trump election in 2016 was the introduction of Facebook reactions. These are the additions to the like button that brought us wow, angry, sad, ha, ha, love, and more recently, care. And the idea as represented by Mark Zuckerberg was to give you better options for expressing yourself, to make it easier for a user to indicate how they felt about any particular post. And while reactions may help your friends better understand how you feel, it also begins to build over time a more detailed profile about a user's emotional life on Facebook, providing multidimensional data about their emotions in context. In other words, reactions make possible a form of emotional surveillance, letting Facebook and others figure out, in the words of Cambridge Analytica's CEO, our hopes and fears. And so my response to this launched in early 2017 is a work I call Go Rando. Go Rando is a web browser extension that obfuscates one's feelings on Facebook. Every time a user clicks like, Go Rando intercepts that click and instead randomly chooses one of these seven reactions for them. So you click like and you might get love. You click like, you might get haha. -ha. Click like, you might get like, but the idea is that over time, a user will appear to Facebook's algorithms as someone whose feelings are perfectly balanced. As someone who feels angry as much as haha, -ha, or sad precisely as much as love. And you can still choose the specific reaction if you want to, it doesn't break that functionality. But even when you do, that choice will be obscured by an emotion profile increasingly filled with noise. In other words, Facebook and anyone else who gets access to that data 
won't know if a reaction was genuine or not. So it injects noise into the system, it obfuscates how you feel, but of course it doesn't just obfuscate your feelings for Facebook, it also does so for your friends. Uh, and those incongruencies force a previously obscured aspect of the interface into the foreground, which is that we're all reporting how we feel all the time, and we feel obligated to do so accurately. In 2019, after a decade of projects focused on the platforms these companies had engineered, I realized I wanted to step back a bit and think more about who engineers software in order to better understand how it comes to be the way it is in the first place. And that led me to focus on Mark Zuckerberg as a quintessential CEO in Silicon Valley and using every one of his publicly available video recorded appearances as an archive from his first appearance in 2004 up through 2019, uh, 15 years, I decided to extract every time he spoke one of three things, the word more, the word grow, and his every utterance of a metric, one million or two billion. And I used this to create a video supercut that chronicles Silicon Valley's obsessions with growth during the first 15 years of the social media era. And when I started working on this, I thought, this is gonna add up to a really long supercut that nobody's gonna wanna watch. It's probably gonna be five minutes or eight minutes, um, but I wanted to watch it, so I, I got to work. And I got to five minutes, and I got to eight minutes, and I got to 10, and I got to 20, and by the time I was done, it was nearly 50 minutes long of nothing but more grow in numbers. And I think the scale of the project is fitting to its subject. Um, Obviously, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, uh, but I will show you uh, a snippet, about four and a half minutes. Uh, it's the, the full work, and also what I'll show now is uh, in temporal order, so it starts when Mark's age 19 in 2004, and it ends at his last interview right before 2019. Many more, 400, 500, 100,000 for 100 or 200. To grow it, and therefore it would grow thousands. I mean, there doesn't necessarily have to be more. Almost a million. More focused on growing really quickly. More than 40%, more than a third of a few thousand more schools. I think I have like 15,000 pending friend requests. More than a few thousand, 100 or 200. The 100 or 200, 6 million, 6 million, 100 million, 100 billion of more. Hundreds of thousands, it's more, it's much. Sharing more information, taper the growth, more of it, more engaging, and that users trust more are gonna be the ones that spread through the system more. They're gonna get more, more, a, a, a lot more, become more open, share more, make themselves more open and share more. More than 70 million, maybe a few thousand speak more. Just grew so quickly and there's more of it. A lot more, a lot more, a lot more, some more. Fastest growing hundreds of millions is more, a lot more, a lot more, more, it's more, 50%, more, more than 500 million, more than 50%. And now it's, it's growing. Was more, make them more, much more engaging and three quarters of a billion for almost half a billion, multiple billions and be more, a lot more and more and more, more tens of millions of tens of millions of more, more that are more, more than a million, right? More than a million, um, 10,000, tens of thousands for one more, much more, a lot more, an order of magnitude more, it's more than 200 million billion, the growth more of access to more, and I'm so much more, half a billion more, probably a lot more, would grow more and more, sharing more and more, sharing more and more, and billions, a trillion or more. Thousands of more than a trillion. There's a lot more to more, one more, 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 a billion, 500 million, half a billion, or more, more, more efficient, more, the first billion, way more, six billion, 11 million, five billion, 11 million, kept on growing to the next billion, more. You know, a billion isn't like a magical number, five billion, billions, 699 million, more than 40% of more competition, more, it's more, it's around 20%, and then, and, um, and we're, we're growing, more engaging, more sharing, more. What's more likely is that almost a billion grow and more than a hundred thousand on grow. You know, I mean, grow, growing really quickly. More human, growing more stuff of more than one to get more. There are thousands at a hundred percent. People want more, more valuable. We've been pushing just to get more thousand or a hundred million, nine thousand, one thousand, or two thousand, or three thousand, or four thousand, or eight thousand, one thousand. Right? It's it's nine thousand or ten million or a hundred million or more. It's actually growing really slowly. It's growing. It's not growing at a fast rate. Five billion, one and a half billions, five billion. It's about 2,600, right? 1,500 is the data. Focus on the first billion. You know, the, the first billion, way more, continue growing. And more data, more, 
but also more more money and more profitable and then a lot of more a lot more multiple times more more things more profit gets more do more 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 things more 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 get more 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 a hundred or more a billion or more grows more has grown to grow and grow that's growing more data I think do more to grow more more accelerate the growth of tens of billions a lot of more more tools more more tools it grows it grows even more profitable and grows even more 250 million more a billion community of a billion a, a billion is kind of an arbitrary number uh, it's a nice round number but it's a little arbitrary billion billion about a billion four billion four billion a thousand or ten thousand times more uh, more than half of more than more than it's hundreds of millions of more than more than 15 million more more, 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 not less. More, more, even more, more things, and more than 50, more, but more than thousands, of hundreds of millions, of millions of more, more. When they just said more than a hundred, more, more, and you, you grow more than a hundred, grow more than everyone else, more than half, of more, 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 grow, growing growth team, growing more, about a billion, five billion to billion, billions of more, 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 a lot more, more will be more, it's gonna be a lot more. 85,000, about 200 to 225, getting more and more. More followers got more engagement, about a million, 100,000. What's grown into more than a billion, gonna get more engagements. Millions of more than 50 times as much. More, because when more, thousands of more, thousands of more, more than a million growing, more than 10, more and more, 2 billion more open, even more. More open, more, more, that the more are more, 30 different, more, more than 100 million, almost 2 billion to 100 million of them, more than 50%. Uh, more, a lot more, one billion, more, thousands of more, so you can a lot more, more, more than a million, thousands of, we may find more, but we can do more. We will more than double, we'll add more than 250, share more, more, more services to help more thousands of, some of the more, a hundred times or a thousand times bigger uh, than billions and billions of, with tens of millions of, tens of millions, as many as two million growing and improving quickly, and we'll keep you updated with more soon. And about millions of, more to do. And you can find more than more than two billion giving more. Uh, so we've definitely grown. About a hundred billion times deserves more than growing in importance. More experiences that we'll have about twenty thousand. There are tens of thousands of more tens of thousands of a few more things. More than twenty million. More than eighty million grow and grow more of oh, more. And we've been more tens of thousands of more. We're more twenty thousand more. More focused on more thousands of more and more and more a lot more a lot more still more steps give you more a lot more a lot more like feeling more 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 one and a half billion more deeply more two and a half billion feel more more by fifty million more than two billion of more than two billion more eighty million four and a half million many more just gonna go more and more more just even more on two and a half billion. You gotta understand there's 10 times that much. So more, more, more. When the pandemic arrived in 2020, I, like many others, found myself glued to my phone more than ever, engaging in an activity that became commonly referred to as doom scrolling. But in those early days of the pandemic, doom scrolling wasn't just a natural reaction to the news of the day. It was the result of a perfect yet evil marriage between so many of us stuck online, social media interfaces designed to game and hold our attention, and the realities of an existential global crisis. And this led me to create a work that I call The Endless Doom Scroller. It's a website that presents a never-ending stream of doom, but without all the specifics. Its interface mimics the feed style of social media, and its headlines are abstracted versions of real ones. And you can scroll for as long or as fast as you like, but you'll never get to the end. They just keep coming. It's a reductive interface that distills social media sites down to their barest, most generalized messages and interface conventions. It shows us what's behind our scroll-induced anxiety interfaces and corporations that always want more. More doom leads to more time on site, leads to more of our personal data, which leads to more profit for them. So after a decade of investigations focused on Silicon Valley's obsessions with more, much of it on the work and words of Mark Zuckerberg himself, I found myself last year asking a new question. Does Mark Zuckerberg ever talk about less? So I set about searching the same video archive I had assembled two years earlier, finding and extracting the relevant bits and assembling those into another video. And while my intuition and recollection told me I wouldn't find nearly 50 minutes of less, I was still surprised to discover just how little it occurs in his rhetoric. 
Because when I added up all the less that he spoke about from age 19 to age 34, I found it took less than 60 seconds when all strung together. And while that tiny bit of less certainly reinforces the previous film, it also made me wonder, what might the world look like if Mark had thought about less as much as he'd thought about more? And so I used this raw material to create a new film called Deficit of Less, where I set out to reanimate the CEO into an alternate reality, expanding his less to be just as long as his more taking those few bits of video and show and slowing them down to nearly 50 times their original length. I'll just show a minute of this. How might the world be different if Mark had been this inert? Where would we be as a society and a planet if he hadn't been so focused on growth and engagement to make the world more open and connected? What if Facebook had been engineered to give its users time rather than taking it? Or more specifically, what if a social network wasn't always growing or limited your ability to use it or tried to slow you down rather than speed you up? In other words, what if a social network wanted less instead of more? And this question is what led me to create Minus. Minus is a finite social network where you get 100 posts for life, where every time you submit to the feed, it subtracts from your lifetime total. And then when you reach zero posts left, that's it. No exceptions. The feed is reverse chronological, not algorithmic. Post timestamps are vague. <laughs> Nothing is monetized. There's no likes or follows or noisy notifications. And the site's only visible metric counts down, showing how many posts each user has remaining. So just like life, Minus has limits. It doesn't pretend, like big social does, that everything, including our time and attention, is infinite. And part of what we wanted to know with Minus is how disorienting would it be to interact on a platform that doesn't try to induce endless engagement from your every waking second? What might users say or make when freed from infinite demand? And while this is an ongoing project, I'm currently studying the contents of the feed to discern what kinds of cultures have emerged and emerge on finite networks and how they are different from the cultures of big social platforms. Uh, I'll be writing that up soon, but I can already say that there are unquestionably radical differences between Minus and its pseudo-infinite counterparts. Minus tends to be more playful, poetic, often heartfelt and genuine. Its uh, feed is multilingual, and sometimes it can be really funny. Its users are reflective and intentional. Intriguingly, there's also very little trolling or harassment or disinformation. Even when it appears, when somebody does post that, it never goes anywhere because the structure of the site doesn't amplify or reinforce. So I invite you to try it out yourself at minus.social to see what online interaction can feel like on a social network designed for less. Thanks.
So at this time, because we have a little bit of time left, I would invite Ben and here to start a bit of a discussion. And then if you feel that you'd like to bring the audience in at any point, uh, feel free to help yourselves. Yeah. All right. It's very exciting to be on stage. Um, I feel, uh, you know, and we've known that ever since we met in 13, that our work, it's not similar, uh, it's complementary. Uh, it's, it's always felt that way, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and it's only the second time. <laughs> Uh, we uh, we meet uh, you know in in, um, in real life. Uh, we we are in regular contact. So um, and uh, so yeah, it's exciting uh, yeah. you know that um, Kalats gave us the opportunity uh, tonight uh, you know to to come together and uh, discuss uh, uh, the work and the the topic uh, you know in um, yeah in, in detail uh, together. I, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's uh, thanks to Andrew and CalArts for the opportunity. Um, you know, I, maybe the place I want to start to conversation is the so much of the topic of, of your your presentation tonight and sad by design and also st stuck on a platform uh, really uh, talks about so much of what is now known, not only to academics and artists and scholars about the negative effects, the negative psychological effects of social media platforms, uh, but now it's really, for many, for a few years now, it's really part of the public consciousness. I mean, it has come through in so many different ways. Uh, one of the more recent ones being, uh, you know, the Francis Haugen document dump from, from Facebook slash Meta and how, even you know, Instagram's research has now been revealed to confirm what so many people have been saying for many, many years. And you know, this is reported regularly uh, in the news media, talked about it's hard to even talk to anybody who uses social media now and not have a potentially long conversation about how they feel bad using social media. So given all of that, why are we still there? Why are so many people still there? How is the, uh, where do we go to, to, to try to move to, the, to some next step? Yeah, you remember very well when we met in the uh, Unlike Us uh, context 2013 that we still had the idea that there was a possibility of, uh, you know, what we called uh, the MySpace effect where, uh, you know, a, a, a vast amount of people, millions, uh, uh, mm, they didn't quite decide to move on together. It was maybe more like a, a thing of the herd or, you know, the swarm, give it a name. But nonetheless, there, there was, uh, you know, evidence that we experienced ourselves throughout the years of the, the Web 2.0 and the first social networks that, uh, you know, all, all these people could and would move on, mm -hmm. right? So the exodus uh, was a real lived uh, experience. And yeah, by, I don't know when, uh, exactly 12, 13, 
15, maybe. You, you must know from, you know, the videos, the more, more, more. Uh, you know, at, at some point, there was, there was no more exodus, right? And that's what I then later, you know, called stuck on the platform. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, the impossibility of, of, of having an alternative, um, w suddenly, uh, you know, uh, appeared to me, and it, it appeared to me, uh, you know, being an activist, be, having been worked on social media alternatives for so long, uh, firmly believing that, uh, you know, okay, something would be um, subcultural, or, you know, maybe in the beginning it was not working, maybe, uh, you know, but eventually, uh, something you know would um, would emerge and it didn't <laughs> and this uh, then uh, you know politically speaking of course coincided with first brexit trump alt right mm -hmm. uh, rising uh, you know a populist uh, a movement across the globe right even well beyond uh, let's say the uk or, or uh, america right this became a, a worldwide movement and so uh, the, the chances of just, um, uh, yeah, um, um, developing a, a critical uh, awareness uh, in large parts of uh, the population was certainly, uh, you know, very rapidly in 16, 17, certainly uh, out of the scope. And then I, I found myself that I, that I had to force myself to completely change, uh, uh, you know, my approach from an activist approach to understanding, first of all, you know, because we were tapping in the dark, you know, maybe you, you all remember early 17, you know, we were absolutely, we, of course, we knew about Cambridge Analytica, etc. We had, we had a vague idea, but the, the wider impact on, on the, on the mental state of what by, by then was already many billions of users uh, was largely unknown and it took uh, a couple, indeed a couple of years to figure it all out. Yeah, I, even though we have ended up with, I mean, you know, it, it has become somewhat in vogue to talk and think about Facebook, for example, as a social network that people don't like to admit that they use even though there's two billion people using it. Um, one thing I find interesting about this, and it kind of comes to another point that I've read from you talking about in Sad by Design, which is that as we've moved from Facebook to Instagram and Instagram now to TikTok, TikTok uh, I mean, being addicted and to TikTok is so talked about on the platform, it's a meme on TikTok. And I think it, it brings up this thing that you've written about, which is that users find themselves um, unable to disrupt their own behavior, um, literally stuck, not just on the platform, but stuck in the scroll, uh, unable to, to move forward. And um, I don't know, is it like, yeah, so only a, a very radical reset, you know, uh, you know, is, is probably probably one of the the, 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 the possibilities. Um, and, um, um, I don't know what civil war, uh, f um, lack of electricity, or some something, right? Uh, something that is way more urgent than than everything that uh, you know these uh, distractive uh, and ex you know ex. Uh, Exhaustive um, uh, social media have uh, on offer in our uh, uh, busy everyday lives. Yeah, I guess I almost would have thought that, or I feel like there's a, what, six weeks ago? Mm. Sarah would know um, exactly when this was, but I think there was a moment for a couple of days where we thought maybe Elon Musk taking over Twitter might, might be a new moment where everybody was, I mean, there was a day or two where everybody thought this is the end of, of Twitter, and it, perhaps it still will be. Um, who knows? But uh, it's we we keep ending up in these situations where I mean I don't know what it is that's going to um, 
take it over. I think we thought that with the Trump election, and we, you know, we, we keep thinking, though, this is the moment when people are going to finally make a change. Yeah, so, um, so while, uh, while that's um, uh, simply not, uh, not happening, um, you know, th it should not distract us, however, from either critiquing it or, uh, you know, working on, um, on alternatives, right? So th that's uh, definitely there. And one of the good things uh, I find about, you know, that young generations that grow up, uh, they're, 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 they still offer some kind of a, of a possibility, right? And uh, in, the, in the, the gap that uh, Gen Z created, obviously, uh, you know, TikTok uh, jumped in. And um, it's a bit surprising that, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was so asleep. In a way, he was already saturated probably by the time, you know, they, they got online. He, he just didn't notice, right? And so that gave uh, this this uh, <coughs> this one-off uh, opportunity um, to this uh, Chinese company that uh, you know was basically a rip-off uh, or a re, re yeah a, a much more refined version of cha Snapchat to to enter. And yeah, this is what um, another uh, project of uh, the. Institute of Network Culture has been studying, it's our oldest and still existing network, it's called Video Vortex, and there we look at the, the politics aesthetics of online video. And yeah, there, uh, you know, the, the trend has, has, has been very, very clear. And it's shocking, you know, equally shocking uh, as all, all this is, that 83% um, of the current, uh, you know, bandwidth and traffic of the global internet uh, is online video in all its uh, sh shapes and sizes, which means that the social media itself that we think of uh, as really big, right, are in that remaining 17%, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so that, that in itself is, uh, uh, is also something that, uh, you know, we have to be very, very uh, aware of that this uh, the transformation uh, of, of this whole internet beast into uh, uh, something that is so deeply um, uh, you know, defined by uh, visual culture, by visual information. Mm? Uh, yeah, that, uh, or, or we could even say, you know, is it just a, a banal uh, return uh, to video, um, uh, television, cable? Yeah, that's another way of, uh, of, uh, of looking at it. Maybe we've just returned, <laughs> you know, back, uh, back to where, where, where we started from. Yeah, back to in, in a slightly more, let's say, interactive uh, fashion. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, certainly, you know, one of the characteristics of TikTok is the way in which it's not, um, it's not so much a, a social network as in, oh. in the way that we think about Facebook and Instagram yeah, even. Yeah, um, and we end up, uh, I mean, it leads me to think about another thing that I wanted to ask you about, which is you know, part of what makes, I think, TikTok so able to keep people stuck uh, within its grasp is not so much the algorithm, which I think is way overhyped, it's more um, the, the sensuousness of the flip and the way in which um, it makes it easy to forget all of those videos that you didn't like, and as you search for the few that you do. And one of the things you also write about in Stuck on the Platform is how alternatives, if we're gonna have viable alternatives, they need to be compelling experiences. And I think this, this word compelling and kind of like the, the spectrum of compelling, like how compelling does it have to be to be viable, but how, but you don't want to go too far and you can't go too little or it's, um, nobody's going to want to use it. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on, yeah, on this work. Certainly, I, I still think, uh, funny enough, uh, you know, uh, it's been uh, monopolized and uh, vulgarized and, uh, but I, I, I think uh, tools for uh, communities you know, is the way to go, and uh, that uh, so many people would find it a, a relief uh, if, uh, if 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 small 
and useful uh, tools, you know, for for existing groups, whether it's uh, you know friends or the the sports club, or uh, it doesn't really matter what, mm, right? If something like that would be on offer, where 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 small and, and meaningful direct um, um, you know communication and exchange would be at at the forefront. You know, so um, yeah, I, I, I think there this is a, and there's even a, you know a, a commercial um, a possibility uh, out there because none of the uh, the tools uh, that uh, are in use at the moment uh, anymore uh, you know fo uh, f fulfill even or even this this very basic um, uh, you know uh, opportunity or or, or need. That it, that is uh, that is out there, right? So that's that, uh, and whether you know it should be uh, funky or you know whether it uh, should be sexy or you know because a lot of people would then uh, immediately think ah oh, it has to look uh, has to be ugly or something like that just because it's simple. Uh? No, I I don't think so. I I I um, I, I think there. There must be ways, uh, you know, to design it in such a way that is extremely uh, appealing. Hmm? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I, I think scale is the we're never going to compete. Nobody's ever going to compete. Yeah. Um, nobody except some massive corporation or VC-funded startup with. Uh, yeah, only, only, yeah, only systems to that get have rid of followers. You know, just all <laughs> the, it would be such a liberating thing. Right? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, if you just have, uh, you know, people that you, that you do some, that you have a, a, some kind of affinity with, hmm? and of course they do not follow you. The people, you know, your family is not following you. Come on. I mean, <laughs> this is, <laughs> it's already, uh, you know, from, from very early on. I, I, I found it, uh, you know, a bit of an absurd idea. Yeah. No, you're condemned to your family. God damn, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the <laughs> that's the, the the very definition of it, right? Uh, your family is not following you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and in the same way. Uh, yeah. Sorry, but uh, for instance. No, you don't need to apologize. You know, <laughs> so, uh, so to to redefine, you know, what the what the social is. I I think there's. There's so much uh, opportunity. Also, you know, gangs and uh, and tribes and uh, you know, uh, kind of clouds of friends. You know, uh, it's all out there to be uh, to be reinvented and to to be, to, to become uh, meaningful again. Instead mm -hmm. of uh, this stupendous uh, you know stuff around it that you you know you, you clearly show. Uh, you know, and uh, in that sense, um, yeah, the, to take the numbers away uh, is, uh, you know, is a very good uh, first step. And you must have had good responses uh, yeah, absolutely. from people. Absolutely, right? yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, although I'll, I'll admit that when I started, a lot of people said, well, why would you do that? Uh, isn't that what social media is for? Um, for... Uh, Back Quant to quantification yeah, of your social that, life. That's how you know if is, you're doing well. Is this a well. good thing? Is this what? Uh, yeah. I'm not saying I agreed with it, no? but it, but th this was a reaction back then, and I think as time went on, more and more and more um, <laughs> people found that oh, maybe there is something here. <laughs> yeah. um, should we see if the yeah uh, no for sure any questions in in the in Please. the room. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just like, curious to know what you all think of um, the sort of like broader, like all the layoffs in tech and the kind of perhaps it's seen the end of this like endless faucet of venture capital money and the kind mm -hmm. of all the scams sort of imploding and Zuckerberg putting all this money into the metaverse that doesn't seem to be taken up. Like, is there a sort of um, fatigue? Maybe? Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I think uh, uh, <coughs> it started with Libra uh, back in uh, late 19, for me at mm -hmm. least, 
where uh, which was uh, very clear because we've been running this Manila project uh, since 2013. I've been involved in that for a very long time. It was very very clear that they had no clue. Huh? Uh, and, uh, and that they uh, kind of wanted to buy into something that was uh, a hype or something, and they didn't quite know. Uh, you know, th th this company has a huge size, and it was very, very easy from our point of view, you know, to further financialize and monetize what they were doing, right? But that was, of course, completely uh, unnecessary because they already made so much money, so much profit, right? So the, the, the financialization and monetization, for instance, of Facebook and Instagram was, for them, was completely unnecessary. Because remember, you know, they were the inventors of, uh, of the Silicon Valley social contract. You give your data for free and instead, uh, you know, you get our service for free. And, right? and so they, they always kept the whole financialization uh, of their own platforms as far as, uh, as, as possible. And of course they wanted then later on, okay, you can pay something and then you can buy something, right? Especially uh, um, fancy clothes and okay, on Instagram you could do uh, a little bit of that, right? But that was, I felt was a bit half-hearted even at, at, that, at that point. Right, so um, uh, for venture capital, uh, this whole uh, s thing was uh, un unnecessary, and we could say about uh, you know their their attempt to, to do something with the metaverse, uh, something uh, in a very uh, a s similar way. Uh, they, uh, I, my reading of it is very simple. Mark Zuckerberg was envy that a lot of the people you know, really hundreds and hundreds of millions, okay, more and more and more, uh, uh, suddenly, uh, by the end of March of 2020, found themselves on Zoom. They didn't find themselves on Facebook. Hey, they suddenly went somewhere else. Huh? Uh, how strange. Uh, that, was, that must have been, you know, uh, disruptive uh, for them. They thought, of course, everybody's online, everybody's with us. And they were not, right? And companies, etc. Uh, very soon, uh, weeks later, yeah, it diversified a bit. Okay, the, uh, the one half went on Teams and the other on, uh, it was on Zoom. But yeah, uh, mm, and m then they thought, okay, if we want to overcome that, we want to build something in, in 3D world. And of course, their, uh, you know, their experience, of course, um, uh, really uh, somehow paid off. And they didn't even use, um, you know, the uh, the opportunities uh, they they had. They had a lot of in-house uh, uh, experience um, with uh, with uh, metaverse stuff, and they didn't use it. Why not? And so th this was an enormous, uh, yeah, m mistake. One uh, the, uh, opportunity to kind of bring bring the whole COVID thing, let's say, to a next level. And a lot of people would have would have bought into into that, and I think they still would, but not you know in uh, in, uh, in in this uh, silly way as uh, they they presented it. So it was a massive uh, failure. I don't know how you looked. Uh, did you follow it a little bit? The whole yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing that, that's hard to get around is that the metaverse kind of sucks. Um, you know, like, go get, a, go get an Oculus, stick it on your, f on your head, and 10 minutes later, your neck hurts. And, and it's super low resolution, and it's, there's nobody there, and it's not very interesting. Um, so, so that's a challenge. I, the, I'll just say on the, I mean, many good things were said on the, you know, I agree with here, but I'll, I'll add one other additional point on the, the tech layoffs thing, which is that um, I don't hear anything about layoffs at TikTok. And I, th I think what's going on here is that 
all of the social media companies, since their initial launch, so Facebook had an idea, Mark Zuckerberg had an idea, mostly it was grow as fast as possible, but it was also, you know, sh make your relationship status visible to, to the rest of the world, um, or, or, or to the people who want to know about it, I guess. Um, Instagram was, was images, Snapchat, you know, it, it had stories. And instead of improving on the ideas that made them successful in the first place and really getting more and more into it, they just started copying each other. Um, and this is true of Twitter too. They just, it's, it's, it's almost like every social media corporation becomes a copy of every social media corporation. And adding, adding yeah, so adding viewers. somebody gets audio, you know, yeah. Clubhouse comes along, Twitter integrates it. Yeah. Um, Snapchat gets stories, now Instagram's got stories, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the story. And TikTok is, is you know, although there are things that they have, you know, they did it from uh, Snapchat, they, it, some of those interface things I was talking about before, I think, are, are, are things that they have doubled down on and they haven't yet gotten to the point where they're just gonna start copying everybody else. Maybe they will. Um, so I think that's part of it too. Is, Um, the, the phenomena that you mentioned, uh, because I don't really think we have evidence that the firms are standing to lose a great deal of money, with the exception of maybe Twitter because it's being run by a complete yeah. imbecile. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the other firms I don't think are necessarily in such a downturn. What actually they're doing by, uh, by shrinking their uh, footprint in terms of employees is uh, maximize profit. So they're just you know, they're just actually going to probably increase what they can generate with fewer people. And the cuts are coming at very specific places. So it's not just any engineer, it's engineers in, in machine learning, equity, uh, accountability, and transparency. Mm -hmm. It's not just any policy person, it's policy people in human rights, um, not in other kinds of, uh, you know, uh, let's say less political, I guess human rights is political for these firms, uh, roles. It's not people uh, in some parts of the company, but it's the entire staff in the DEI wing of the firm. And so what they're doing is actually responding to a perception of the political climate that is relatively depoliticized vis-a-vis -vis a few years ago when people were in the streets and they put all these people into the firms as a sort of window dressing, really. They have no commitment to um, you know, the well-being of society. They have a commitment to looking like they do, but when they think nobody's looking, that's gonna be the first thing that goes, and that's what's happening with the layoffs, primarily. Good explanation. Very cynical. Yep. <coughs> okay. Uh, yep. So I think the last few years, we've seen a growth in uh, group chats, which seems to be low-tech, maybe even non-platform or uh, very uh, well, I, a smaller use of the at platform? At first it was uh, you know, relatively uh, hidden groups in WhatsApp, by yeah. the way. Groups, <laughs> yeah. But, but I think that it's also been commercialized a bit too, like uh, influencer personalities now run private groups for themselves. <laughs> so I'm wondering, do you think it's maybe half exodus or yeah, definitely. It's it's uh, the the um, uh, yeah the difficulties uh, to find trace them. There's this uh, overexposure and um, awareness of people that um, they don't want, including by the way, uh, you know, politicians. Um, it's well known that um, not this uh, in this round of. Um, uh, Brazilian elections, but uh, the one before, and also the one um, uh, one of the previous uh, elections of uh, Modi, uh, that uh, you know they said uh, we don't want uh, mobilization <laughs> anymore to be visible. You know that we don't want that. Hmm? We want to organize, yes, but we don't want uh, others to find out exactly, you know what uh, what what's going on. And that trend, yes, indeed. Um, is only further uh, spreading, but that's only because you know on on the very uh, visible platforms. And uh, yes, we we saw the picture, 
right? We almost forgot, but the uh, Arab Spring and uh, yeah, the Facebook revolution, etc. You know, these were revolutions that were all uh, you know too too visible, mm? and it, it, they had that uh, visibility uh, in uh, in mind. But everybody I involved nowadays knows that you know an, an early visibility is an extreme liability. You know, you, <laughs> you don't want you don't you don't want that. Boomer, doomer situation. But I, I also was motivated by one meme that just popped up and made me think of something from, you know, when my youth, when there was a tremendous, terrible, deleterious social practice that was handheld, that was everywhere, where the affordances were spread throughout society. And it felt like it would never go away. Mm -hmm. And that was smoking. Mm -hmm. Right? So, yes, it can feel like there's no escape from addiction. But the combination of social pressure, you know, law, and generational change does affect things. It's not always, I think, I hope, it's not always this sort of endless regurgitation of the sort of, you know, Japanese giving up with a gun, but then taking it back. There are things, it'll be a, it'll be a difficult thing to bring, to bring smoking back in as it was, right? I, I, so, so I just kind of, I'm excluding me. Yeah, but, but, uh, but I, 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 I like the the, ex, uh, the, yeah. the the comparison, and uh, it's been made uh, many times. Of course, uh, it's a bit of a, a question, really, um, uh, about the question of uh, is social media um, a real addiction? And um, of course, there are some, uh, you know, um, medical re uh, research and and papers in journals that um, you know point point in that direction and really want to uh, want to talk about the extreme cases but the the vast majority of people are quite cautious uh, to medicalize uh, to medicalize it right and and so um, while uh, you know the, such a phrase like the social media is the is the is the smoking of the of the 21st century you know, it's uh, and uh, many many people would immediately say, mm, "Okay, yeah, there's something in the, in that, right?" So, so to to plainly deny uh, that this is that, that in this uh, that this analogy, uh, uh, there's something in it. Oh, definitely, definitely, there is something in it. Uh, but uh, the the problem there uh, is is one uh, of uh, of medicalization. Mm? And uh, this is a social problem. It's a problem uh, of the way we organize, uh, you know, uh, exchange, your social life, uh, media and communication, but not necessarily uh, a medical uh, issue uh, to start with. And this, this is where, uh, you know, that uh, analogy, which is so correct, um, somehow stops. Hmm? Uh, and maybe also, you know, we'll have to just deal with an, an, a whole other thing, and maybe the a addiction in the in the in the medical sense, uh, you know, of of even uh, you know withdrawal symptoms or something like that. Mm, maybe not. There's there's something else happening, and that something else, I would say. Uh, is 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 the the design of uh, social life uh, today? Th I think th that's ultimately what uh, what's at stake. And we also know that the social life will have inevitably in this twenty first century a techno social component. There is no way around that, right? And then the question really becomes: What will be the architecture of? Of of that, mm? and and that's what uh, what's at uh, at stake, and that's for me also the the exciting part of it, you know, because 
I feel we're at the very, very beginning uh, of, of, of that, you know. So that's why uh, I'm still very, very motivated about that very, very uh, early question that was po put on the table. What is the social in social media, hmm? right? And that is uh, unresolved for a good reason. So that's an exciting thing. And I um, maybe want to uh, end <laughs> on this uh, positive, uh, positive note here because, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm part of social movement uh, activist, and for me, uh, you know, the exploration of of these very very dire and dark uh, mental states is done for 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 a reason. Mm. Uh, and we could also say, mm, okay, was this a, was this a, a dead end street, or uh, you know, will this uh, eventually uh, bring us further? And I think we have to go through this desert, this desert of the desperation. There is no, yeah, to, to, to deny it, we've done that for many, many years. That didn't bring us uh, anywhere, right? So the, uh, the recognition uh, is, is absolutely, <laughs> you know, in, in line with AA, yes. <laughs> yes, that, that first step of recognition we cannot uh, uh, just, uh, you know, circumvent that and say, um, no, uh, skip it. No, we need to do that. Otherwise, uh, you know, um, we're talking here about really um, uh, uh, feelings uh, and uh, mental states of literally billions uh, of, uh, of people. So, um, and that's not nothing, it overwhelms me on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the more and more and more, Ben, uh, for you uh, also must, uh, you know, because uh, there is something real in that more and more and more. Um, Facebook still has 3.6 billion users. So, <laughs> you know, uh, so, so that, 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 that re overwhelming reality, hmm? Uh, of 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 the vastness of it uh, is also uh, an, inc an an unheard challenge. We have never been uh, there so far. You know, we've never been uh, uh, working at at, at at such a scale. <laughs> yeah, more, more, more. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I. I would agree just on this, on, to try and also leave it on an optimistic note, because it's easy to just always steer back into the negative, but I 100% agree that there's, the experiments have hardly been tried. There's hardly any experiments that have been tried at all. I can just sit down and, and just write on a piece of paper and just come up with strange, weird ideas for, for, for different configurations of the techno-social that w nobody has, has coded yet or put in front of anyone yet. And I think if we could normalize the idea uh, enough that it's interesting and worth it to try some of these experiments and to spend a little bit of time there. Ex exactly. Then I think we could see uh, uh, a whole new era of, of interesting experiments. All right. Thank you very much.